Hello and welcome to The Brian Voice. I'm Randy Seaver. Our study of the epistle of Paul to the Romans has brought us to chapter 14 of that epistle in which the apostle is dealing with the issue of Christian liberty. Uh, how we ought to react to our stronger brethren or our weaker brethren, depending on which camp we find ourselves, um, in, in regard to those things that we either allow or do not allow as far as our practice is concerned. Um, I'd like to just talk about some principles, first of all, that need to guide us and some things we need to understand as we look at this passage, and then I'd like to look at some of the details of the passage and, and make our way through it. First of all, when Paul talks about weak believers and strong believers, he is not talking about those uh, who are strong believers as being uh, more advanced in sanctification or in those who are weak believers being less advanced in sanctification. Instead, he's talking about those whose consciences are strong. That is, they do not have uh, scruples about practicing certain things. And those who are weak are those whose conscience is weak in the sense that they do not believe that they should practice certain things that some of these stronger believers are able to, to um, practice. Now, what, what Paul is very clearly telling us here throughout this passage is that we ought to receive one another as brothers in Christ, even if we have a different understanding of what should be permitted for us and what should not be permitted for us. Um, so strong believers are those who have uh, fewer scruples about what they ought to practice than the weak believers have. The strong believer has a strong conscience and believes he can freely practice what others might condemn. The weak brother is a person who has scruples and believes that there are certain things that he should not practice. Now, keep in mind that when, when Paul talks about these things, he is not talking here about moral absolutes. There are certain things that are absolutely wrong for anyone to practice at any time, in any place, and this has been true throughout all of history. Uh, these are what we would refer to as moral absolutes. There, there, are, there are certain things that are always right, and there are certain things that are always wrong, and to practice these things that are clearly wrong would be uh, a sin, and therefore um, Paul is not talking here about moral absolutes, but he's talking here about those things that we, were, we would refer to and others have referred to as things indifferent, that is, things that are in and of themselves neither right nor wrong. Paul says, I am convinced that nothing is unclean of itself, but to anyone who esteems it to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And so these issues are not moral absolutes. They are things indifferent. They are neither right nor wrong. A person may be a good Christian and either practice certain behaviors or abstain from those practices. That's the point that Paul is making. And the reason we understand this uh, is that Christ has received both those who are strong believers and those who are weak believers. And if Christ has received us, Paul says, then we ought to receive one another to the glory of God. Now, there are two wrong ways of reacting in this matter of Christian liberty. And Paul identifies those in these passages, in these verses. Uh, Paul says, um, one of those ways is to despise or to look down on the person who has scruples about certain practices, and the other is to condemn those who have no such scruples and freely practice what the weaker brother is unable to practice. Paul is, Paul, uh, Paul's instruction is that these two groups should accept each other because God has accepted them. Listen to what he says here in this passage. Um, in chapter 14 of Romans um, let not him, verse 3, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. And so if you have a pen or a pencil, just circle those two words, um, despise and judge. These are the two problems. We see the same thing again in verse 10 of this passage. Look at that with me. At verse 10, uh, Paul writes this, but why do you judge your brother or why do you show contempt for your brother? 
for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And so Paul is talking about these two wrong ways, uh, and the respective groups um, have been apparently uh, reacting wrongly by either sitting in judgment on the stronger brother or despising the weaker brother. Uh, now, um, Paul outlines in this, this passage the ways in which one should pursue um, the behavior they believe is pleasing to Christ. And notice that in both cases, Paul is saying that these two groups of people are pursuing a, a course of action they believe is pleasing to Christ. One group is not saying, I don't really care whether I please Christ or not. I'm going to satisfy my own desires. Um, the other says, well, I'm going to just observe all these um, rules and regulations because I love Christ and I want to please him. No, both groups, both groups here, Paul says, want to please Christ. Uh, they uh, do what they do because they believe Christ loves them. And they are able to thank him for what they're doing. And so, first of all, Paul wants to show us how we ought to pursue this, uh, whatever course of action we believe we ought to pursue, whether as a weak believer or a strong believer. Um, and notice he doesn't say that it is the responsibility of the strong believer to convince the weak believer or the responsibility of the weak believer to convince the strong believer. Uh, that is not what Paul's saying here. First of all, Paul says a person must be fully persuaded that his behavior is pleasing to Christ. That is the whole basis of what Paul is saying. Each of these groups, whether you're a strong believer or a weak believer, you must be convinced in your own mind that what you are practicing is pleasing to Christ. Look at verse 5 of the passage. Um, One person, Paul says, esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Um, and so each person must be convinced that the, the, the course of action they are following is pleasing to Christ. Um, secondly, a person must be able to give God thanks for what he either practices or does not practice. Listen to what he says in verse 6 of the chapter. In verse 6, Paul writes, He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And I'm, I'm assuming here he's talking about the Sabbath or a Sabbath. Um, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and he gives God thanks. In other words, he's doing what he believes is pleasing to Christ. He's doing what he, what he believes God will be, be, be pleased with. And so um, he is able to give God thanks for that which God has given or for that which God has withheld from him. Um, thirdly, a person must in everything he practices remember that he belongs to the Lord and has no right to live to please himself. Look at verse, verses 7 and 8. In verses 7 and 8, Paul writes, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. And therefore, whether we live or die... We are the Lord's, for through this end Christ both died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the living and of the dead. And so what Paul is saying here is uh, we do not have a right to, to live to please ourselves. Christ died for us that he might be our Lord. And if we really love him and if we have been converted, then we are going to live to, to his glory and we are going to submit to him as the one who has the absolute right to rule and reign over us. He is our Lord. Jesus both died and rose again so that he might be Lord of the living and of the dead. Number four, a person must remember that there is only 
one who has the right to judge. And therefore, we must stop passing judgment on one another, either by judging or as considering a person a nincompoop because he doesn't understand uh, the level of freedom that we enjoy. Um, there's only one who has the right to judge, verses 9 through 12. Listen to what Paul wrote. For to this end Christ both died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of, of the living and of the dead. But why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each one of us must give an account of himself to God. You have no right to judge another man's servant, Paul says. You are not the Lord of another person's conscience. It is not up to you to correct the behavior either of the strong believer or the weak believer. You have one Lord, you have one judge, and we will all have to stand before him and give an account of ourselves. And so that should be our primary consideration when we begin to think about how we handle this whole issue of Christian liberty. A person must remember, and this is where, what we're going to be coming to, and a large part of what we're going to be saying uh, is controlled by this principle. A person must remember that there is a difference between Christian liberty and the exercise of Christian liberty. There is a difference between Christian liberty and the exercise of Christian liberty. We're going to look at that in verses 13 through 22. But before, before we do that, I want to remind you that a person must also remember that there is a difference between giving offense and taking offense. There's nothing we can do to keep other people from taking offense by our actions. There is always going to be someone who is going to have a judgmental spirit and is going to decide that they have the right to sit in judgment on us because of something we do. And so whatever we practice is going to cause someone to take offense by what we're doing. Now, we cannot do anything to avoid that. That is not what Paul's talking about when he talks about giving offense. What Paul is talking about when he talks about giving offense is another matter altogether. Look at it here in this passage. Um, in verse 20, 21, Paul says, It is good neither to eat meat, <clears throat> nor to drink wine, nor to do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. In other words, we must be careful that we don't put a stumbling block in the way of our brother by doing those things that we have liberty to do but we know that he does not understand uh, that kind of liberty. Uh, we have a responsibility to govern ourselves in such a way that we are not giving offense. We are not causing a brother to stumble, that is. We are not causing his conscience to be emboldened to do those things uh, that he really has not come, come to grips with yet as being permissible for him as, as a believer. We must keep in mind that not everyone understands liberty, and we must uh, govern ourselves, therefore, if we are strong believers, we must govern ourselves in such a way that we do not either offend the brother, that is, we don't, do not embolden his conscience to do those things that he does not yet feel free to do because he sees us doing them. Um, John, for example, has the ability to go into the uh, place where Jesus was being judged, and um, he was able to deal with that situation. Peter, seeing him do that, goes into the same situation and falls as a result of it. I think that's a good example of how we ought to treat this issue. Um, John may have had complete ability, complete liberty to do what he did, whereas Peter obviously did not have the ability to handle the situation. We must live our lives in a way that we will not embolden our Christian brother to live in a way that he is not yet comfortable living. Um, so don't cause him to stumble. Don't uh, offend him. Uh, 
uh, don't make him weak. That's Paul's uh, counsel for us as strong believers. Um, and then, of course, uh, Paul very clearly teaches us in verse 23 that we ought never to do anything about which we have doubts. If you are not fully persuaded in your own mind that it is right and good for you to practice a certain thing, then you must not practice it. If you have any doubts, uh, we are to be completely convinced. Paul says, verse 21, it is neither good to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything which causes your brother to stumble. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. In other words, don't flaunt your liberty. Happy is the man who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts, that is, he who does not have confidence that what he is doing is acceptable to the Lord, he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith or from confidence. For whatsoever is not from faith or from confidence that this is a right behavior is sin. And so a person should never practice anything about which he has doubts. Um, now, coming back, to, coming back to this whole idea of the difference between Christian liberty and the use of our Christian liberty, I'd like to quote uh, uh, John Calvin. Listen to what Calvin wrote. There is a difference between Christian liberty and the use of Christian liberty. Christian liberty is an, is an internal thing. It belongs to the mind and to the conscience and has direct re reference to God. The use of Christian liberty is an external thing. It belongs to conduct and has reference to man. No consideration should prevail on us for a moment to give up our liberty. But many a consideration should induce us to forego the practical assertion or display of our liberty. That really is what Paul is going to be dealing with in verses 13 through 22. Listen to some of the statements that Paul makes here. Paul says in verse 13, Therefore let us not judge one another any more, but let, rather let us resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. We must always consider our weaker brother. Don't put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in your brother's way. He then says, uh, verse 14, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. And he's, again, not talking about moral absolutes, but he's rather talking about indifferent matters. There is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. If you think that meat that has been offered to idols is unclean, then you have a responsibility not to eat that meat. That's what Paul teaches in other passages. Paul says there's nothing unclean about it. It's just meat. There's, just because it was offered to an idol doesn't mean it's unclean meat. And yet, if you esteem it to be unclean, then for you it is unclean and you must abstain from it. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if, yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, and this is the principle, you are no longer walking in love. If you know that your weaker brother is going to be offended by what you're doing, and you say, I'm going to do it anyway because I have the liberty to do it, then you are guilty of not walking in love. And keep in mind that to love your brother is the fulfillment of the law. If you don't act in love toward your brother, then you are breaking the law of God and you are guilty even though the practice you are engaged in itself is not in and of itself a sinful practice. You are guilty of sin, however, if you disregard your, your weaker brother's weakness and his scruples and you decide to trample over your weaker brother and do what pleases you and just to gratify yourself. That's the principle Paul's talking about here. And so he says in verse 16, don't let your good be evil spoken of, uh, for the kingdom of God is not 
eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. What's what's Paul saying here? Well, what Paul is saying here is um, if, if you practice things that you know are going to be a stumbling block for your Christian brother uh, because you think the food is the most important thing, then you have misunderstood the character of true religion and of the Christian faith. The Christian faith is not about what you eat or don't eat. Now, this is not one of those uh, go-to-the-mat issues. Um, what is important, what is really essential as far as true religion and as far as the Christian faith is concerned is that we, um, according to this verse that we just read, um, that we do not let our good be evil spoken of because the kingdom of God is not about food. The kingdom of God is not about these, these peripheral issues. The kingdom of God is about righteousness and it's about um, peace, and it's about joy in the Holy Spirit. And then he says, For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. And so um, Paul says we need to understand the true character of the Christian religion uh, and our responsibility as those who are under the authority of Christ. And then in verse 19, Paul says, let us pursue those things which make for peace and things wherewith or by which we may edify or build up one another. What Paul is saying is, don't tear down your weaker brother. If Christ loved your brother enough to die for him, then you need to, to, to love him enough to abstain from certain practices if you know those practices are going to make him weak or are going to hurt him in the realm of sanctification. Consider your weaker brother. Therefore, let us pursue the things that make for peace and the things which we, with which we may edify one another. It should always be our desire and our design to build one another up. So he says, do not destroy the work of God. Don't tear down something that God is building up. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil to the man who eats with offense. And so Paul says, it is good neither to eat meat, nor to drink wine, nor to do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Notice the things he mentions. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother is made to stumble. What Paul is saying is these issues are not black and white issues. What Paul is saying here is these are indifferent matters. Whether you drink wine or not is a matter of indifference. In other words, you are not sinning by drinking wine. I know there are some good evangelicals who will tell you that we ought simply to abstain from drinking alcoholic beverages altogether uh, because uh, drinking alcoholic beverages is going to lead us uh, to drunkenness. Well, it may lead us to drunkenness and it may not lead us to drunkenness. It's not for someone else to determine that. If you have liberty to do that, Paul says, have that liberty yourself. Liberty to yourself. Don't thrust that on someone else. But you may practice that. You see, it's a, it's a matter indifferent. What, whether you eat meat or not, and particularly in other places, Paul talks about meat offered having, that has been offered to idols. Paul says that's a matter of indifference. Uh, it's not right nor wrong. Uh, but be careful how you use your liberty. That's the point Paul's making. Um, and then he says, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. If you have that confidence, then exercise your liberty, but don't flaunt it so that you're going to, in flaunting it, hurt your weaker brother. And so Paul goes on in chapter 15 to say, we who are strong ought to bear the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. That ought to be paramount, paramount in our minds. We ought to live in a way that we are not pleasing ourselves at the expense of our weaker brother or at the um, danger of uh, 
uh, bringing reproach on the name of Christ. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to, here's the word again, edification. Our view ought to always be to build up those uh, who are our weaker brothers. And Paul gives as the reason in verse 3, for even Christ did not please himself. But as, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you have fallen on me. That's, of course, a quotation from Psalm 69 and verse 9. The reproaches of those that reproached you have fallen upon me. Even Christ did not please himself. And therefore we, his followers, should not live to please ourselves, but to please him and to edify our Christian brothers. And then Paul says, For whatever things were written beforehand were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. In other words, Paul is really saying we ought not to be unhinged from the Old Testament Scriptures. Whatever was written in the Old Testament Scriptures were written for our comfort, that we might have hope through the Scriptures. Now he says in verse 5, The God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another. In other words, Paul is urging unity. That you be like-minded one to another, according to Jesus Christ, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he concludes in verse 7, Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. This is our responsibility. And either way, whether you're a strong believer or a weak believer, you have a responsibility to live for the glory of God. That's the point that Paul is making. And you have a responsibility to live in such a way that you will edify your brother and not tear your brother down or destroy him, that is, do damage to him. You need to stop tearing down what God is building up. Well, I hope this has been helpful to you. We're going to make our way uh, on into uh, chapter 15 and try to uh, wind this study up fairly, fairly soon. Uh, there's a few issues, uh, much of what Paul is going to be doing in the chapters that remain uh, or the verses that remain is uh, greeting people and, and commending people and dealing with just some um, um, issues of um, courtesy and that sort of thing. And so much of what we're going to be looking at is just going to be very quickly scanned over, and then we're going to get into some issues in chapter 16 again. But we're going to be looking, Lord willing, next time at chapter 15, and then we'll move on into chapter, uh, chapter 16 and conclude our study. Again, I hope this has been helpful. If you have comments or questions, leave them below in the comment section. And until next time, may God richly bless you.